من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد مولاي علي بن ابي طالب عليه السلام الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم والفرقان الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل سلام فسوف يعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وعلى محمد The subject concerning the rights of servants and dignity of labor is a subject that impacts all our lives. What are the rights of servants? What are the rights of laborers? Or those people who work for us, what are their rights? In terms of Islamic and in terms of different religions and what have politicians done to impact the lives of laborers? those people who are employees, the working class. So we'll begin by a hadith from our fifth Imam, Imam al-Baqir sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al-Baqir said that there are four things that if you have within your life, then you will be forgiven and you will be placed in the higher realms of heaven. You want to enter paradise, you want to be forgiven by the Almighty, pardoned by God, then attain these four characteristics. Number one, attend to the needs of the orphans and treat them as a parent. Give them fatherly love. Give them the love of parents. You want to attain heaven? Number one, treat orphans with love. Attain to their needs, their desires. Allah several places within the Quran talks about the orphans. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 2. They do not change the good for the defective. When you give the orphans their hair, their fair share, their inheritance, do not fraud them, do not scam them, do not scam them, do not cheat them. In verse 127 of Surah Nisa, Allah also talks about the orphans. Imam Ali, in his final will, what did he say when he was about to pass away? He said, be careful in regards to orphans. So number one, Imam Al-Baqir said, you want to enter heaven? Be careful in terms of treating the orphans. Number two, Imam Al-Baqir, he says, be kind and helpful towards the weak. Those people who are oppressed, the mudloom, those people who are sick, those people who are financially unstable, be kind towards them, be compassionate towards them. Treat them equally with the rich. That's number two. At times you see this sort of behavior. That when a rich person comes, definitely some people will stand up and say, Salaam alaykum. A person who is a middle class, not from the elite class, when he enters a room, nobody greets him. Oh, ha. No, that shouldn't be the case. Treat them equally with the rich, according to Imam al baqir and then, number three, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The one who treats his parents with kindness and looks towards them with a loving face. That means you treat them with love, with respect, and you understand that it is due to them that you have been given this life. That's number three. Number four, Imam al baqir states, you want to attain heaven, you want to be forgiven, what's number four? A person will only attain heaven and he will be forgiven. Who? A person who does not get angry with his or her servants, does not get infuriated when they make a mistake and they help them in their tasks. When you give them work, when you give them any sort of task, you respect the fact that I need to also assist them and you do not give them such a work that is beyond their capacity so at times you know your employee or your servant might not be able to attend work why? he or she is sick does it mean you say no 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 you have to come I have guests at my house I'm cooking biryani for eat even if you are sick you have to come even if your daughter has passed away you have to attend no 
You have to be kind towards them and compassionate. Imam al-Baqar says so. You want to go to heaven, you want to be forgiven. Number four, treat your servants, treat your employees with respect. And Islam has always enjoined that you treat your servants in such a way that they are your family members. Rasulullah would treat them like his own family members. In fact, he would not dress better than them. He would treat them equally, he would not discriminate. Therefore, Will Durant, a Western historian, he writes in his book, The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, page 209. Will Durant, he says, Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That during 18th century Europe, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting the exact statement, but a general understanding of what Will Durant, a Western historian, states. He says that during Europe, 18th century, 19th century, I beg your pardon, those people who would work for factories, factory workers, they would be treated with respect, no doubt. You can't mess with factory workers. If you treat them harshly, if you do not give them their wages, they are going to leave you high and dry. You will not be able to produce products. You will not be able to produce goods. So they will be treated with respect. Will Durant says that the Muslims during their time, during Prophet Muhammad's time, they would treat their servants with so much respect, even more than those owners, those employers would treat the employees in a factory within Europe. Rasulullah's followers, the followers of Prophet Muhammad, followers of Islam, would treat their employees in such a way with even more respect than those workers working in European factories during the 19th century. Imagine. Further than that, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu wa sallam, he was once working with Tambar, Tambar, his male slave. And they passed by a shop. So Imam Ali purchased two garments, two attires. So one attire was a cheap, you know, normal dress, not very exclusive. The other one, mashallah, was beautiful, absolutely fantastic. Expensive, uh, very, very stylish. Imam Ali called Qambar and said, you take this stylish dress. This garment, this expensive attire, you take it. Amr said, no, Ya Mawla, how can I allow you to have this cheap coarse dress, this normal attire, while I take the expensive attire, I take the expensive garment, how is it possible? Imam Ali looked towards Qambar and he said, Qambar, you are a young person, you are way younger than me. And young people should always dress nicely, they should always look handsome, therefore take this garment that I bought, but you take it, it's a gift from me. In fact, Mawlana Adil Raza, within his speech, he stated that these slaves who would work for the Imams, who would work for the Prophet, they would love working for him, for them, to such an extent that when they were free, when they were told, leave from here, it's okay now, you can go and lead a normal life, you do not need to walk under me. They would cry, they would begin weeping and wailing. That Ya Mawla, please do not free us, we still want to serve you. We are gaining knowledge from you. We are being treated so wonderfully by you. Why should we go to someone else? And why should we lead a normal life when we are leading such an amazing life under your service? Imagine. And therefore, a book by the name of the Encyclopedia of Islam, volume 1, page number 35, a Western historian, he writes that there is perhaps no nation that has treated the captives, the slaves, the servants and the very toilers of the galleys with more respect and more kindness and more compassion than the Muhammadans. Now who are the Muhammadans? We, we are the Muhammadans. The Muslims basically, the Westerners, if you read their books, they would write Muhammadans. Muhammadans refer to the Muslims. Now why Muhammadans? Followers of Prophet Muhammad. Even today, we have certain books and certain Western uh, philosophers who still don't call us Muslims. They say they are Muhammadans. So, he writes in his book, this Western historian, in 
the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 1, page 35. There is no nation that has treated the slaves and the servants and employees with more respect than the religion of Islam and its followers. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If you open Alama Majlisi's Hayatul Qulub, Alama Majlisi has offered many books within our sect. Hayatul Qulub, Volume 2, page 562 to 563. And Abu Ahmad al Isfahani. He also writes within his book, volume 4, page number 58, both of them state, and it's there within several tafsirs as well. If you open the enlightening commentary, Agapuya's tafsir, etc., this particular narration is there. That Rasulullah was once seated with a few of his companions, the poor companions, not the elite class, who Ammar ibn Yasir, Salman al Farsi, Suhaib ibn Sinan, and Khabbab ibn Arad. Khabbab ibn Arad is basically the father of Abdullah ibn Khabbab. Who is Abdullah ibn Khabbab? A faithful Shia. His father Khabbab ibn Arad, famous companion of the Prophet. And Bilal. They were sitting and a few other Muslims, not very well off, not very rich, not very wealthy. So a few unbelievers passed by and they saw Rasulullah sitting with his you can say people who do not belong to the elite class. They look towards the Holy Prophet, they say, Ya Rasulullah, or you who claim to be the Prophet of God, you are sitting with these people. Is it that Allah has bestowed His favor upon them and not upon us, the rich? If you want us to follow you, then one condition. What? Leave their company, leave them, forsake them, abandon them and come towards us. Give us company, follow us, and then we will follow you. You give us company, you give us respect that we deserve. Don't treat us equally with these people who are poor. No, we have a special respect within society. This is what the aristocrats, the elite class would say during that time. Things are not different, but that's a different story on its own. Rasulullah waited for an ayah to be revealed. Which ayah? Surah An'am, chapter 6, verse number 52. Allah, what does He say? وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاوَةِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا What does Allah say? Do not drive them away, those people who call upon their Lord during the mornings and in the evenings. No, and let not your eyes pass from them. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, a similar verse. These verses, Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. These two verses, the Arabic wordings, if you notice, they are actually very, very similar. Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18, verse number 28. What does Allah say? That drive not away those people who call their Lord during the morning and during the evening. And let not your eyes pass from them. Now Allah is not only talking to the Holy Prophet. Allah is talking to us Muslims. Not only Muslims, but to all human beings. Because this Quran was not revealed only for Muslims. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 138, This is a declaration for humanity. Quran was revealed for mankind, for humanity, not only for the Muslims. This is a misconception. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 1, Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52, that this Quran is for mankind, for all human beings. So Allah is addressing all human beings within the Holy Quran. That do not treat those people who are poor in a disrespectful manner. Do not drive them away. Do not do that. And therefore, there are many people, many servants of the Ahlul Bayt who love working for them. I will only discuss two, but before the Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Number one, we will look at who they are. We will get into a bit of detail on who they are, what they have done for the Ahlul Bayt, and after serving the Ahlul Bayt, how their lives progressed. So number one, Salman al-Farsi, Salman the Persian. Salman al-Farsi was not born Muslim. <laughs> Salman al-Farsi, he was the son of a Zoroastrian priest. Zoroastrianism is a religion. So, he was born 
as a Zoroastrian and then he converted into the religion of Christianity. He became a Christian. You see, when you see people converting from one religion to another, it's not something bad. It's something good because they are searching for truth. They are looking for the right path. They are looking for a path of justice, a path of kindness, compassion, generosity. So Salman said, you know, I'm Zoroastrian. I respect my religion. But you know what? I feel Christianity, you know, its rules, uh, the proofs and evidence that I have gathered, they tell me that you know you need to join Christianity. He then served a Christian priest. After that, what happened? After long lasting hardships, he went and served a monk in the Antioch. After that, what happened? He was sold from one master to another. A gang of warriors, they captured him, and he was sold from one master to another. During that course of time, he found out about that prophet. Now, who is that prophet? The Bible, you see, Salman al Farsi would read the Bible. He read a verse. Which verse? This verse is still there within the Bible today. Gospel of John, the New Testament. You know, the New Testament has four Gospels John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19 to 25. What do these verses say? They say, that are you the Christ? They ask John the Baptist, Nabi Yahya, art thou the Christ? John the Baptist, Nabi Yahya says, no, I'm not the Christ. That's Jesus. And they say, then who art thou? Art thou Elijah? Are you Elijah? Now who is Elijah? That is a debate on his own. Some people, some scholars say, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Some say, no, it's Nabi Elias. And Christ himself in the Bible says, Elijah is John the Baptist. But John the Baptist, Yahya says, no, I'm not Elijah. And then they ask him, then are you that prophet? Now who is that prophet? Verse 25 of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it says, If thou art not the Christ, not the prophet, not Elijah, who art thou? That means they were awaiting three distinct personalities. They were waiting three different people. They were waiting for Christ, Nabi Isa. They were waiting for Elijah. That who it is, still, it's a matter of debate. And then they were awaiting the Holy Prophet Muhammad, prophet, that prophet. So Salman was looking for that prophet. And we have discussed many a times in the past, in my speeches, I've talked about Prophet Muhammad in various world scriptures. He's mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, the Christian scriptures as well. This verse, normally very underrated, but it's a very, very interesting verse. John 1, 19 to 25. So Salman saw this verse, and he's like, who is this prophet? And then he heard about a man in Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula. This man, he said that I speak up for the rights of women. I am a feminist in reality. The Holy Prophet was a feminist speaking for the rights of women, thinking about daughters who were getting married, thinking about those wives who were ignored by their husbands. You know Surah Mujadila, chapter 58 of the Quran? What does, what does Mujadila mean? The woman who pleaded to the Prophet. She was complaining about the treatment of her husband. The Holy Prophet came and spoke up for the rights. Salman heard about this. He heard that a man was involved in a league of justice called Hilful Fudur. Before Prophet Muhammad declared prophethood, he was part of Hilful Fudur, the league of justice. Now, Salman heard this and said, you know what? This man has to be that prophet. He came towards Rasulullah and he converted into the religion of Islam from Zoroastrianism to Christianity and Islam. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He says Salman was like Luqman. Salman al-Farsi was like Luqman. Luqman, there's a whole chapter in the Quran that is named after Luqman, chapter 31. Further than that, Imam al he said during certain predicaments, certain instances, Salman was even better than Luqman. Further than that, traditions and narration state that he was from the Mutawassimi, from those people, Salah ala Muhammad wa Muhammad, those people who knew the inner characteristics of human beings. And then it says that he was from the Mutahaddathi, those people with whom angels would communicate with. He would not want to communicate with angels. Angels would want to 
communicate with him. Who? An employee of the Ahlul Bayt, a servant of the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the magnanimous stature, the magnanimous position that they have attained. Further than that, in Allama Majlis is Aynul Hayat. He writes, and by the way, the fact that Imam Ali said Luqman, Salman was like Luqman. Who says this? Allah Majlisi narrates this. Ibn Sa'ad narrates this. Abu Nu'ayn al-Isfahani, a Persian scholar, he narrates this. And this is there in Allah Majlisi is Aynul Hayat, Imam al kadhu He says that on the day of judgment, a few angels will call out. That who are the Hawariyin? Those people who remain faithful towards the Holy Prophet. Who, where are they? I would like to gather them. And who will answer the call? They will say that we remain faithful to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That they will say we remain faithful to the covenant that we made with the Prophet. We never deviated from the right path during the time of the Holy Prophet, whatever message he left for us, we followed suit. But who are they? The answer is that they are three. Salman, Meqdad and Abu Dhar. Salman al-Farsi, an employee of the Holy Prophet. Imagine. Look at the status of Salman al-Farsi. Mansur ibn Buzur, he himself belonged to the Persian origin. He was a Persian, a guy speaking Farsi. He came towards the sixth Imam and he said, Yeah, Imam, why do you love Salman al-Farsi so much? Why do you remember him every time? Imam said, first of all, don't call him Salman al-Farsi. Don't say Salman al-Farsi. Say Salman bin Muhammad, the Salman from Muhammad. And I love him because of three reasons. Number one, he left behind his own preferences. He first kept the preferences of Ali. He first thought about what my Mawla Ali thinks. He did not think about his own desire. No, 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 no. First, I'm going to focus on the desires of Ali. That's number one. Number two, why do I always remember Salman al-Fars? What is number two? He treated the poor with respect. And he treated them equally with the rich. You see, being a rich person is not something bad, not something that should be avoided, it's something good. But that richness should not make you proud, should not make you arrogant, should make, not make you braggadocious. So number two, he thought about those people who, who are poor and gave them an enormous amount of and respect. Number three, I love Salman al-Farsi, Imam Sadat says. Why? He loved knowledge and knowledgeable people. Salman al-Farsi was an employee, was a servant, but look, due to the fact that the Ahlul Bayt treated him with love, compassion, now look at his status, look at his development. This is what Islam teaches us. That when they work for you, yes, no doubt, allow them to showcase their skills, but make sure you allow them to develop as well, just like the Ahlul Bayt. So that's number one, Salman al-Farsi. Who else? Number two. And the final person we are going to discuss, final personality, who? Fidda al-Nubiyya. Fidda. Bibi Fidda. It's sad to see that not many people have analyzed the life history of Bibi Fidda. It's something really uh, sad. But the fact is that there is a lot about Fidda within history. As soon as Bibi Fatima died, Imam Ali married Fidda to a man by the name of Abu Thalaba al-Habash. Imam Ali conducted the marriage of Bibi Fidda and Abu Thalaba. This is a lesson for us that when we have servants, when we have people working for us, employees, give them fringe benefits, not financial incentives. What are fringe benefits? Give them children's education fees, give it to them. Give them a good working environment. Imam Ali, what did he do? He could have said, Fidda, I pay you a salary, please go and get married. I don't need to bother. No. Imam Ali got her married, recited the nikah, and financially supported Bibi Fidda for her marriage. Extra money. Bibi Fidda, an nubiyya And then they had a son. But after a few years of marriage, Abu Thalaba passed away. And then Bibi Fidda got married to a man by the name of Malik al-Ghadathari. 
Imam Ali did not say that, oh Fidda, I have already arranged one marriage for you. Now that's it, I'm not gonna pay extra. No, he said, your husband passed away. Would you like to get married again? You would? Yes, I'll arrange again for your marriage. Malik al Khattafani and Bibi Fidda got married. In fact, Malik once went to complain to Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalif of Islam. Malik went and said, oh Umar, I have a few complaints about Fidda. Umar looked towards Malik and said, a person from the family of Abu Talib is more knowledgeable than a person from Banu Ali. That is, do not have doubts on the knowledge of a person who belongs to the family of Abu Talib. What is this trying to tell us? That the Ahlul Bayt would treat their family with their employees with so much respect until the Caliph during that time says that Bibi Fidda belongs to the family of Abu Talib. She is not their employee, she belongs to the family. This is the status of Fidda. There's an interesting narration, you know, many a times we hear that Bibi Fidda would quote Qur'an. She would only speak Qur'an. There are many instances, I will only narrate one. Very, very interesting. She was traveling once and the caravan, they go, it got lost. So let's say we are traveling towards Arusha and suddenly we get stuck somewhere. So, these people were lost. They looked towards Bibi Fidda and a man approached Bibi Fidda and said, Who are you? What's your identity? Bibi Fidda looked towards this person and did not reply using normal Arabic words. She used the wordings of the Quran. Surah Zukhruf, chapter 43, verse number 89. And say salam towards them and turn away from them. Bibi Fidda was upset. You are coming to me right now. You are asking my identity. First, greet me. Many a time you see people, oh, let's get to the point. No, begin. Hi, hello, how are you? Salam alaikum. I hope everything's all right. Bibi Fidda, she doesn't even know the man. The man doesn't even know Bibi Fidda. Instead of saying salam alaikum, straight away he starts, who are you? Bibi Fidda says, wa qul salam fa sawfa Chapter 43, verse number 89. This man realized his mistake. He said, salam alaikum, I'm very sorry. And then, he said, Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then this person started getting annoyed. As soon as he started talking, Bibi Fidda would always reply using the Holy Quran. So this man, you know, he got a little upset, got a little angry, and he asked a silly question. You know, many a times when we have debates, and when you see that a person is losing, or another person has an upper hand, straight away, stupid and silly questions are asked. So let's say you go and have a debate with someone. A person knows that he's losing. Obviously, he's going to start asking silly questions. So this person, he tried making fun of Bibi Fidda. He said, oh Fidda, are you a human being or a jinn? Are you a human being or a jinn? Bibi Fidda again replied using the Quran. Surah A'raf chapter 7 verse 31. Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum kulli masjid. Khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. O children of Adam, Ya Bani Adam, attend to your embellishments at every time of prayer. Our question is that what is Bani Adam? Why does she quote this verse? Try to say that I'm a human being. In Kiswahili, what is Bin Adam? Bin Adam, Bin Adam. In Arabic, Bin Adam. I'm a human being, for goodness sake. And then, this person continues, Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Where are you from, O Fidda? She replied using Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 44. Ula'ika yunadawna. What? That they come from a place far distant. Ula'ika yunadawna min makanim ba'id. That they come from a far distant place. I am from a far distant area. And then this person, he was shocked, bemused, kept on asking questions, she kept on replying using the Quran. Where are you going? What are you going for? She replies using Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 1, verse 97. 3, 97. Walillahi ala nas hijjul bayt. I am going to the hajj that has been made incumbent by Allah. And then this person says, Who are you with? Did you come with your children? Do you have your husband with you? Do you have your father with you? Who do you have? Whom have you come with? She replies using four verses. 
First, she quotes Surah 38, Surah Sa'ad, chapter 38, verse 26. Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaak khalifatan fil ard. O Dawood, we have made you a caliph on this earth. And then she quotes Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 144. Wa ma Muhammad illa rasul. And then she quotes what? Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 12. Ya Yahya, khuthi al-kitaba bi quwa. And then she quotes Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 11 to 12. Ya Musa ibni rabbuk. Now question is, why does she quote all these verses? She quotes a Quranic verse talking about David. She quotes a Quranic verse talking about Muhammad. She talks about uh, Yahya, John the Baptist. And then she talks about Musa. As soon as she finished, four of her sons, their names were Dawood, Musa, Yahya and Muhammad, all of them came towards Bibi Fitta and the man. And then she said, did you get your answer? Now do you understand? I have come with my four children. And all these four children, their names are there within the Quran. That's why I go to the Holy Quran. Our last segment before I move on to the Masai, will be talking about dignity of labor. What's dignity of labor? Dignity of labor is a philosophy that states that all occupations, all work, all labor have to be respected equally. Whether you are a doctor, I will respect you in the same way as I respect a sweeper. This is the dignity of labor. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India. Well, whatever differences we may have with him, we may not agree with all his policies, but he's a politician within India, influential politician. And by the way, many people get confused. They say Narendra Modi is the president of India. No, president of India is Pranab Mukherjee. Prime Minister is Modi, but people know him more because he does more work than Mukherjee. The Prime Minister in India does more work. So Narendra Modi says that dignity of labor is a national duty. This is beautiful. Dignity of labor is our national duty. It has to be part of our nature. Father than that, Martin Luther King, social reformer, he states that all dignity has to be respected that uplifts humanity. The Bible talks about labor in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse number 23. Whatever work you do, do it wholeheartedly. Do it heartily. And the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse number 23, it talks about that hard work will lead to success. But mere talk leads to poverty. I'll end with a verse from the Quran, Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 58. The etiquette of treating your employee, وَالَّذِينَ يُذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And those people who malign believing men and women, you accuse someone, let's say you have an employee, you accuse him or her of something that he or she has not done. You have maligned a believing man or woman, then you will bear a sin and the guilt of maligning and slander. मेरे प्यासे बाबा मेरा मजलूम बाबा एक शख्स वहां से गुजर रहा था एक मोमिन वहां से गुजर रहा था उन्होंने नौहा सुना वो रोता हुआ घर आया बीवी से मुलाकात की बीवी मोमिना थी उस मोमिना ने फरमाया कि आप क्यों रो रहे हो उस मोमिन ने फरमाया हम हमेशा चांद की पहली रात को हुसैन का सदका देते हैं आज मैं जिंदा ने शाम में गुजर रहा था एक बच्ची की आवाज सुनी वो फरियाद कर रही थी कि मेरा बाबा गुजर गया है मेरा अठारह बरस का भाई भी मारा गया मेरा छह महीने का भाई भी मारा गया एक जालिम ने इस जोर से तमाचे लगाए के बच्ची के कान भी जख्मी हो चुके हाँ ज्यादा रो मोमिना ने भी गिरिया किया मोमिना ने फरमाया चलो मैं भी खाना नहीं 
کھاتی چلو ہم زندان کی طرف چلے وہ دونوں زندان میں پہنچے پہلے کس سے ملاقات کی پہلے حسین کی بہن زینب سے ملاقات کی بہن زینب نے کھانے کی طرف دیکھا اور فرمایا یہ کون سا کھانا ہے اس مومنہ نے فرمایا یہ صدقہ کا کھانا ہے بی بی زینب نے فرمایا کہ ہم صدقہ کا کھانا نہیں کھاتے اس مومنہ نے زینب کی طرف دیکھا فرمایا اے خاتون اے بی بی یہ معمولی انسان کا صدقہ نہیں یہ حسین یہ حسین نبی کے نواسے اور علی کے بیٹے کا صدقہ ہے حسین کا نام سننا تھا بی بی زینب نے گریا کیا اس مومنہ نے جناب زینب کی طرف دیکھا اور فرمایا کہ میرے مولا حسین کو آباد اور سلامت رکھے خدا علی اکبر کو سلامت رکھے خدا عباس کو سلامت رکھے پھر سے مومنہ نے دعا دی مولا حسین کو خدا سلامت رکھے حسین کا نام سننا تھا سارے یتیم نے گریا کیا مظلوم حسین مظلوم حسین علی رحمت اللہ علی القوم الظالمین انہا لیلہ و انہا لیلہ راجعون بار الہا تجھے واسطہ محمد علی محمد پر کہ اس قلیل آزاداری کو اس قلیل سی مجلس کو تیری بارگاہ میں قبول فرما جو بے روزگار ہے انہیں روزگار انعیت فرما جو مکروز ہے ان کے قرضوں کو عدا فرما جو بے اولاد ہے انہیں اولاد انعیت فرما And let us remember all those people who are sick, suffering all around the world with the recitation of Amma Yujim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Amma Yujim ul mutarra ila ta'a wa yakshif al-sum. Jami'a. Amma Yujim ul mutarra ila ta'a wa yakshif al-sum. Amma Yujim ul mutarra ila ta'a. And tonight we are also celebrating the Shurwati Shad and as per requested by the organizers I am going to recite a short Qasida Of course we did do Masa'ib, remember Aba Abdillah because that is our custom, that is our practice, that whenever we have any event, we remember the master of martyrs, the man who was admired by many social reformers, Mahatma Gandhi, whether it be Mandela, and we are going to end with the short Qasida in honor of the first Imam, our Mawla, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, therefore, all together, Abdullah Salat. Hey, Pa, 
Chivano Vilchaha Tatan Vali Zehra Vahasan Shabir Sele Taima Mezama Shabir Sele Taima Mezama